Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliet Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. On this podcast, we've explored military propaganda in the United States, but we haven't yet looked at other nations such as China, which, um, at least to me, one of the first things that comes to mind is oh, propaganda, disinformation. We've also yet to discuss disinformation and misinformation, which have been made more relevant in our time by the rise of technology, the pandemic, things like that, also historically. Today, on June 3rd, 2022, it is my great pleasure to have Wei Fang Zong on the podcast. He's a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center, where his work focuses on bridging the, the field of natural language processing and machine learning to economic policy studies. And that might sound like a mouthful. It took me a minute to figure out what that meant. But from reading his work, I now understand. Um, He leads the Policy Change Index Project, which uses algorithms to, quote unquote, read propaganda and to predict policy changes. And we'll get into that and what that means. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So before we start, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? That's a very good question. In fact, I think the answer applies to not only your generation or my generation, or uh, you know any other generations is that I think uh, we don't pay enough attention to history or the importance of studying history uh, because it repeats more often than we think. And uh, to to some extent, that's because of you know people nowadays have more shorter and shorter memory span, or even if you look at the news cycle, you know uh, sometimes it, it, we, you know if, during the for example the Trump administration, people talked about. A lot of uh, in um, uh, events coming up on the White House, and then sometimes you, it, it's even easier to forget. Like, oh, this only happened last week. It felt like uh, ages ago. So, it's, and and so, especially in Washington, in this town, uh, people tend to forget things. But I I do place um, a lot of uh, emphasis on studying history. I did not actually. Uh, I I was born and raised in China, so growing up in China, I did not study history a lot. I guess that turned out to be not a very terribly bad thing because if I learned a lot of history in China, that would be a, a different version of history than uh, you might imagine here. But now that I'm out of China, I, I actually uh, have gotten more and more uh, fascinated by history and how easily it repeats. And I think that's a, a lesson uh, for any generation as well going forward. That's a great response. I love history, but I find myself not lacking the time necessarily, but sometimes it's hard. You don't want to sit down to read this dense book, but podcasts and documentaries and things make it easier. Um, okay, so let's dive in. So I want to make sure before we start that we have a common understanding of what propaganda, misinformation, and disinformation mean. So can you give us your definitions of those terms? Sure, let's start with, I think, misinformation is easier. And let me use an example, say whether wearing masks is uh, effective uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Now, it depends on actually what pieces of information you're talking about. If you say uh, masks is not effective in preventing the spread of the virus, because if you cite some bogus science, and if you don't have any other intention behind spreading that message, then it's uh, purely misinformation, meaning that it's the opposite of truth or it's a falsehood. But if you say that because, say, you want to uh, dispute the previous claim other people made already, the scientific claim that wearing masks is effective, so you want to intentionally revert that and say, uh, no, uh, wearing masks is not effective, then it's called disinformation because you are trying to counter a piece of information or truth with a falsehood. And propaganda, it's, I think goes even, uh, even um, one more step further, is that you're intentionally uh, spreading falsehood for 
uh, with the purpose of influencing people's behavior uh, or how people make choices. So if you're a government official, you come out to say that masks is not effective, so please stop buying them. And, uh, but the truth is that you know that it's effective. You're just saying that because you don't want people to, to hoard and buy, buy up the uh, protective gear so that you, know, you, you, uh, you want that um, to be reserved for uh, medical workers, frontline workers. That's propaganda because you are using that to try to sway people's, uh, change people's minds. You want to change people's actions to serve your uh, specific policy purposes that you're not being transparent about. So that's propaganda. You have a personal connection to these issues. Um, you grew up in China, and as you mentioned in your response to the first question, you wouldn't have known history the way we know history if you had learned it there. Um, has growing up in China attracted you to this issue or given you a special insight that most of us in the West or in the United States don't have or can't have? I think perspective really matters a lot to how we see the world. And I think I have been in different environments or so have my perspective also changed uh, when I was in China versus when I left China. So when I left China, after I finished college, I went to Hong Kong and spent a few years there uh, in a Hong Kong that was much freer than it is today. And then I came to uh, the United States. And so the, I think what's shocking was that you only learn something about China after you left China. And that has happened multiple times. And there was a, in fact, a joke that uh, you don't realize how many people China, how many people live in China until you left China, because wherever you go around the world, you still see Chinese people. So that's what an indication of how, how many Chinese people are actually around in the world. But to me, the, the personal shock was actually that when I, so the, um, I left China and went to Hong Kong. I, I attended the University of Hong Kong. And one of the very first thing I saw in, on campus was the, this, this gigantic uh, bloody red uh, sculpture. It's called the uh, Pillar of Shame. So it's showing a lot of dead bodies piling up. It's, it's like an eyesore. So I was curious, like, what is this eyesore uh, doing on the campus in the, in the middle of like, the, the uh, giant platform? So I stepped uh, closer to it and it says in memory of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. And that's the moment actually I learned about Tiananmen Square Massacre because there was no, no massacre according to Chinese propaganda. So growing up, I, I do remember seeing on television some scenes of protest students uh, on Tiananmen Square protesting. They wanted a cleaner government, you know, less corruption, more democracy, more freedom. And that uh, didn't go very well. Uh, but the television did not say, the propaganda did not say there was crackdown, there was killing on the square, innocent students and residents of Beijing dying. Um, it's also, it's also, it's also a very interesting timing that as we speak, recording this podcast, uh, 33 years ago, around this hour, actually stepping into the midnight of June 4th, uh, 1989 was when the shooting actually happened. Um, but I did not know that until 17 years after the fact, when I went to Hong Kong. So I saw all that. I was like, well, there is this thing as massacre. And I read all the books that I could find in the library at the university. Those books were not, you know, they did not exist in China. I couldn't find those in China. I was able to watch a lot of documentaries in China about, I mean, in Hong Kong about the, the massacre. Those were not uh, certainly banned uh, in China's cyberspace. Uh, with the with the you know the the great firewall of the Chinese internet. So with all that, it's actually what I later came to know that I did not know at all when I lived in China, and that says a lot to me about how powerful information control is in that closed environment. And that's what motivated me to eventually uh, develop the algorithm you mentioned, the policy change index, to say uh, because it's so effective in controlling people's mind, like my mind. It must be very indicative of policy uh, intentions of the Chinese government. So really fast, there are a few things I want to get more into. Um, first, you refer to going to Hong Kong as being out of China. But to many people, especially in the United States, Hong Kong and China are Hong Kong is in China. 
I guess. So what is that distinction? That's a good question. I mean, legally speaking, now Hong Kong is part of the People's Republic of China, China's regime, uh, since the handover in 1997. So when I went to Hong Kong in 2006, I, so I'm not disputing that legal definition for sure. Uh, but when I went to Hong Kong, you know, people in Hong Kong, they, they speak different language. They, uh, they speak Cantonese, which happened to be my mother tongue because I grew up in Guangdong. Uh, the province uh, next to Hong Kong. So I, I, I grew up speaking that language. But for many other Chinese people, when they went to, uh, when, when they go to Hong Kong, they would encounter totally different language, totally different culture. You would need a visa to visit the place, right? So, so much about being part of a, a, a country if you need a visa to visit someone else, uh, somewhere else, right? And so there's a, a lot of things in Hong Kong that felt quite foreign to me, uh, not to say that even when I went in 2006, there were a lot of foreigners in Hong Kong, right? a lot of British uh, residents in Hong Kong. A lot of professors at the university were British professors too. Although, you know, over time they gradually left. And now, so when I went to the university, uh, the main language, you, if you just walk around, uh, was Cantonese. But now if you walk around, it's uh, Mandarin because uh, there, so, there has been a lot more mainland students than uh, it did in the past. And how is, you mentioned that Hong Kong is less free than it was when you were there. What led to this change? How did that happen? Uh, yeah, so some evidence about how it's different now, for example, I saw a lot of books about Tiananmen Square Massacre, right? Uh, just last year, Hong Kong actually purged uh, some books about Tiananmen Square Massacre from its uh, public library. So there are uh, scores of titles about Tiananmen Square were taken off the shelf uh, at the Hong Kong Library. The, stat, the, the sculpture I mentioned on the campus was removed also last year. And uh, for three years now, so Hong, Kong would, uh, Hong Kong residents could not attend the annual uh, candlelight vigil to commemorate the massacre. Uh, it happened in, all, all the way to 2019 and then because of COVID and of course with COVID as excuse uh, and with more control by the Hong Kong government, uh, they, they would not uh, be able to hold that uh, event anymore to commemorate the tragedy. And the reason behind all that was, I, th I see that as almost a destiny, um, unfortunately for Hong Kong, in the sense that uh, China has long learned the lesson that the so-called one country, two system does not work. In fact, Beijing knew that all along. And a good example to reference to was the, uh, how Tibet became part of China in early 1950s, uh, which is just years after the, the People's Republic. So at the time, uh, Tibet was not really part of China, but uh, Mao basically drove all the troops uh, toward Tibet um, and uh, Tibet basically yielded uh, and became part of China. But the uh, integration of Tibet into China in the early 50s was under the agreement that kind of looked like what China in the end had with uh, the British government about Hong Kong. So it specified in the early 50s that Tibet would be operating in kind of a semi-autonomous uh, fashion in China. So they would preserve their religion, their way of life. The Dalai Lama would be the head of Tibet, you know, with, with all that. Um, and then, but it, it quickly fell apart. In just a few years, it fell apart and the uh, Dalai Lama fled China and now lives in India. And because the, the, the Communist Party realized that the one country, two system is contradictory to the authoritarian regime that it was, the, which is its nature. And so I, I did not see Hong Kong being semi-autonomous after the handover, uh, being, uh, uh, how to say, is sustainable. And so it's no surprise really that in recent years, it's, it had to be under tighter and tighter control from Beijing's perspective, and not to mention the, the draconian uh, national security law, uh, the, the, the bill that became law uh, two years ago, which led now to, for example, in the Hong Kong's legislature, there was no pro-democracy legislators anymore. There's no pro-democracy newspapers anymore. And there's, you know, there are countless examples of how uh, 
much Hong Kong has changed in just the last uh, three to five years, I think. Wow. How, how did it feel and how does it feel now to know and to discover all of the things that were hidden from you growing up, especially things so bloody? It, it was it was painful because uh, I mean when I when I first discovered that I rented a lot of documentaries. Uh, you, you had to watch a CD room, <laughs> the uh, DVD as I mean uh, D, uh, DVD sorry uh, DVDs on a computer. So that's what what I did, and uh, you you couldn't easily access that still on the internet. It's not very convenient. Like now everything is on Netflix or YouTube. Uh, but I, I rented those uh, 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 documentaries, and then I watched. Uh, I had I had I had schools in the day, so I ha- I watched at the night, and it was really painful when you watch in a dark room, showing on the screen in the dark evening back in 1989, and then you hear the gunshot directed at students, people running, screaming. It, it, it's it's very painful, but I because I but I, I think looking back, I think more painful to me was actually the fact that I did not know until so much later. It's the shock and the the revelation, and the feeling of being in the dark for so, uh, you know, not knowing it for so long, that was the most excruciating part for me. And this stuff wasn't taught in school at the university, right? There was, so it was very brief mentions of protest uh, in Tiananmen Square. It was categorized uh, as a political disturbance, uh, turbulence, uh, and then it was uh, taken care of by the Chinese government. So no tragedy of any sort that uh, resembles the truth. Wow. Can you tell us about your work with the Policy Change Index and analyzing propaganda, how it works, all of that? So, yeah, so the motivation was precisely uh, that because propaganda is so effective, it's foolish to think that the Chinese government does not choose its word uh, carefully. In fact, the Communist Party spends tens of millions of dollars every year on its propaganda machines. And so with so, so much resources, if you don't use it well, it's irrational, right? So, but everything has to be rational at some point. And so, so that's what motivated me to say, if you think of people in China as puppets because they are under tight information control, I was one of those puppets, but you can think of the propaganda machine as the puppeteer. So here's the idea for the research then, then is that now you can think of yourself as watching the puppet show. So the key is not to watch the puppets and point fingers at them to say, look, they're under control, so sad. That's a common reaction, right? When you think of Chinese propaganda, you think immediately, uh, it's, pro- it's misinformation, it's disinformation. Both of the claims are true. But more important in my view was that now we have the perspective to watch how the puppeteer uh, runs the show. And so from how the government, the Chinese government chooses its words, you could make inferences about uh, the Chinese government's policy intentions. And that this, is, this is how the index works the, uh, the machine learning program works is to say, let's mine all these words coming out from China's propaganda mouthpieces and let's figure out why when they change what they say, what was the reason behind it? So if you look back, one of the product, we have several algorithms uh, in, the, in the product line, but one of them was about the crackdown in Hong Kong in 2019. So the question back then was we wanted to analyze whether the Chinese military would go across the border and crack down on Hong Kong protesters, just like it did in Tiananmen Square. And so if you look back at how the propaganda machine uh, talked about the protest, like I said, it did not mention any, any massacre for sure. But it did, however, in the days leading up to the crackdown, it did change how they talked about the student protesters. Because when they first came on to protest in Tiananmen Square, they love their country, you know, they're good people, they want a better future, they want a better government. And so that's all good. So that was the beginning, right, of the narrative. But then they became demonstrators, and then later they were called protesters, rioters, and then traitors. So toward the end, they were basically like morons. And 
all the change in how it, they were described in the newspaper, all those change actually happened in the days and weeks before the final shooting of them uh, in Tiananmen Square. So the change in language is already indicative of the change in action or the future actions. And so that's where uh, the idea is. So now we have um, one of the ongoing programs we run is to say, every quarter, let's collect all the newspapers coming out from China's People's Daily, the China's version of Pravda, basically. And then we try to see whether they change what they emphasize in the newspaper. Is it, in, is it indicating any future reforms or the opposite of reforms? Is it tightening control or is it, do we, will we see more pro-market reforms or will we see more government interventions? So uh, we are able to every quarter process the change in the scenery, so to speak, of the Chinese propaganda's emphasis. Obviously, that's a significant shift in how we've looked at China and our understanding of what is going on with their policy and all of that. And you already gave an example of how we could see this change. But what sort of discoveries has this led you to? And has that changed U.S. policy towards China at all? Uh, I like to, I, I, my goal is eventually it would help policymakers, uh, ha- help inform policymakers of what the thinking in Beijing is. And that should ideally improve our policymaking toward China. But in terms of the so to, speak, success, so to speak, successes that we had with the index. The, uh, we developed the index in 2018. Um, and so going forward from 2018, the first real test was when we made the prediction in the spring of 2019. So uh, back then there was this trade negotiation between the Trump administration and uh, Beijing uh, about China's unfair trade practices. And uh, in around April 20, 2019, there was wide expectations in Washington and also in Wall Street that one of the key points of the ne- uh, negotiation was the U.S. asking China to protect intellectual property, for example, by opening up market access and uh, basically reducing the role of government in its economy. So this, this is what Washington called the structural changes. And there was wide expectation back then that China would uh, abide by these expectations and actually make those changes. But what we put out as a prediction from the policy change index was that China was not going to make those moves. And the reason we said that is because when we looked at what's emphasis, uh, what, is, what is emphasized uh, in the newspaper, it was all about still how important it is for China to be a leader on the global stage. It made no mentions of uh, the importance of protecting intellectual property or opening up markets for foreign businesses or even just letting market instead of the government playing a bigger role. So the fact that it has not said that uh, indicates to us that China was not going to back down. Uh, And that's because of the going back to the key ideas, right? Uh, A lot of times for policy implementation in China to be effective, the government need to change people's, needed to change people's minds first. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of intellectual property, I grew up in an environment in China, I had never paid a dime on software. So when I went to Hong Kong, it, it was another shock was that I realized you had to pay for software. I remember you know, complaining, it's like, what kind of world do I live in? I have to pay for software? Uh, it was ridiculous. But that's the mentality in China, right? We never had to pay software. And so and to, in order to, for the government to provide better protection on policy, uh, on uh, pr- protecting intellectual property, it had to convince the economy first. Why do we all of a sudden need to protect intellectual property? The fact that it has never said that so far indicates that it, would not, it was not going to back down on the U.S. demand. And China did not back down on the U.S. demand which is what led to uh, later on the, the, the famous phase one trade deal that was not about these structural changes, but, but 
rather primarily on uh, you know China buying more agricultural products from the U.S. And you mentioned that with um, the policy change index, you collect quarterly the newspapers. So here, I don't know. Here, I I know people who write for newspapers and that we have like op-eds and things where you have guest writers who aren't even journalists who will just write for a newspaper and that's put out into the world. What is it like to be a journalist in China? How is it different? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Because I, I, I talked to some journalists in China. It was very hard to do reporting. So they, they would sometimes write stories. Uh, some of the journalists I know who work at relatively braver uh, news outlets, so to speak. Um, they There are things that they wouldn't even write. Uh, there are things that they would write, but uh, they would risk a chance of being shut down, uh, you know, uh, uh, shut down by the editors. Um, and then every time that happens, it you make a dent into your career. And so you would, you have to choose very wisely. Like what, at what point do you try to make an attempt like this? Cause you, perhaps you only have very few shots in your life to be able to challenge the system a little bit. And there are editors who are brave enough to say something, but then they would lose their job. Uh, there are many of them uh, after the Tiananmen Square massacre that tried, they tried to say a little bit about the event and then they would lose their job quickly afterwards. And there, and this, this kind of even limited room is still quickly narrowing because um, I grew, growing up, I liked the magazine which translated to the title, the name of the magazine translated to English was basically uh, The Wind from Southern Window. Because I live in, I grew up in the South. So the magazine is based in Guangdong, uh, the province next to Hong Kong, which is relatively freer, uh, slightly compared to the rest of China. And that magazine was very critical about certain subjects in China, like corruption, for example. Uh, it nevertheless did not challenge the authoritarian government, did not say anything like of the sort of we want democracy, right? So it didn't go that far, but still it, it criticized local corrupt officials. I like, I like that magazine, but the ma that magazine also has lost its power or freedom or room to, to say just that much. Uh, so I think that this, the narrowing of scope of the limited freedom in China was shocking, even in the in the uh, media uh, uh, sector. What do you think is the most important thing for people that people should understand about how information is controlled and the impact of that on the culture and the economy, political economy of China? I think in this country, people have recognized, have come to recognize, I mean, the United States, that, uh, in fact, the popularity of the term fake news uh, has resonated with many people in a sense that now we live in the age of too much information uh, and too much disinformation and misinformation. So I think my, my Mercatus colleague, Martin Gurry, has written a lot about this subject. Uh, and his key point was that we, uh, in the, it, at the time, when media or news organizations have lost their status of being an elite institution. So it used to be the United States used to have only very few TV stations, TV channels, uh, very few influential newspapers, but now you can see anything on social media. And that even for the U.S. president, when he gets uh, his uh, security briefing uh, in the morning, uh, it was known that, for example, former President Obama would ask the CIA director a question like, oh, you are telling me this, but, you know, yesterday I saw on Twitter that, and how do you explain that? So that happens over and over again. And uh, the, I think the distrust on elitist organizations has some positive uh, aspects because it makes people think twice about what they see or make them question um, the whatever stories that they're being told. But the downside, however, was that we are also uh, lost in the sense that there's, there hasn't been good alternative to, because now we don't trust this, but what, what, what else do we trust? 
I think that's the that's a still a better situation. For example, like uh, compared to China now, that uh, people has a vague sense that they 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 don't really trust the Chinese media. But everything else you look at on the internet or in newspapers in China, they are nevertheless uh, uh, tightly controlled information. So you don't even see the alternatives. You don't even see the fake news or uh, the social media. Uh, I mean, you 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 have social media in China, but they are still propagating the same thing. And so I think that's there, there's that's uh, the major difference. I I, I think now between uh, netizens in China versus netizens in the United States. Do you think that there's a point where there's so much control of information that it maybe changes people's minds in the way that they naturally think or controls them to the point where, I don't know, I guess maybe you wouldn't have a reason not to believe the government and whatever they say, but that you genuinely don't question it because that's all you know. I can see uh, a little bit of both, at least. That uh, so the polarization in the United States is very concerning, and one aspect of that is that people are so used to hearing what they like to hear. Um, so if you think about, it, there's no shortage of people who, for example, always watch Fox News, and then another group would always watch MSNBC, as and they don't switch channels, right? And they kind of know that it's biased, but it, you know they like the bias because they are biased and it, it fits their uh, taste. Um, but there's also, I think now people, uh, there are another group, uh, younger generations, I think, um, uh, more primarily, that they 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 don't trust any, uh, they don't easily trust uh, whatever they're looking at. So they they sort of become citizen citizen investigative journalists, and so they will look around, they will find sources, and. A good example, for example, uh, uh, to to give is during the, at the beginning of COVID, there was this uh, speculation that whether the the virus is coming from the lab in Wuhan. Uh, major news organizations uh, had gone a long way, out of their way, out of, on a limb, to dispute that uh, speculation. But the people who disputed that did not have good evidence anyway. But they they say, oh, this is you know. Uh, xenophobia, you know, anti-Asia, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but people who are actually curious about the truth, uh, anonymous investigators on Twitter, for example, right? They, so they, they look into all the archives coming out from the Chinese government's organizations. They find a lot of raw documents, evidence that seems to suggest, nevertheless, it could come from the lab, the, the, the infamous lab in Wuhan. And so that's the group uh, of people, the younger generation that I'm hopeful for or optimistic about is that I think there are people who are curious enough and careful enough to find the truth because we are able to. There are a lot of people who are still curious in China, but they are not able to do anything of that sort. So I want to continue on that path. But first, um, I was reading economist um, Timur Karan, and he was saying that in dictatorial and oppressive regimes, people often keep two sets of books, um, ones that they keep out and are socially acceptable to the public and ones that they have to keep private and can't really share for whatever reason. Usually there's a regime. Um, he says that this preference falsification makes it hard to see how close a regime is to a sudden collapse. Um, in other words, that people pretend to support the regime in public because of the consequences, which makes it hard to see how close to catastrophic failure the regime actually is. This is how you end up um, seeing unexpected, massive revolts that seem to come out of nowhere, even though the discontent was brewing for a long time. What do you think of this theory? And do you think that China could be more fragile in this way than we think. I think it's possible. In fact, if you look at dramatic changes in history, whether we are talking about the fall of the Soviet Union uh, or uh, the Iranian Revolution is a good example too. Um, it has to do, I think, about 
how we gather and analyze intelligence. Because in these examples, I think the the, the exact timing of the fall of the Soviet Union was surprising somewhat to uh, the CIA. The CIA certainly did not see the coming of the Iranian Revolution. In fact, uh, at the end of the Cold War, there's a famous article written by Stansfield Turner, who was the former CIA director. So he wrote in the Foreign Affairs saying that it was a failure on the CIA's part to not see the coming uh, the, the, of the Iranian Revolution. And he said the reason we failed was because uh, we were focused more on stealing secrets, uh, keeping secrets, but we failed to analyze the groundswell of public opinion in Iran. Because had they done that, they would have known that the revolution had a much larger chance than they thought in succeeding. And the same, but the, I mean, it's, it's a prescient warning, but the CIA never really focused on analyzing public opinion. Uh, had they done that, I think they would have known better uh, because they repeatedly made that mistake. For example, they failed to, for, they failed to foresee how uh, the Afghan forces were not willing to fight the Taliban earlier in the year. Um, they fa also failed to see how uh, Ukrainians are willing to fight the Russians. It, was, it turned out to be surprising to them that the, the uh, Ukrainians are doing so well uh, resisting the Russian invasion. So there are all these uh, movements, I think. It takes a lot because you, you have to analyze public opinion in different aspects to come up with a good conclusion. So on the surface, it might look like a lot of the major historical events, they happen just all of a sudden. But perhaps it happens all of a sudden, uh, being very surprising. But perhaps it's only because we didn't look close enough. And this is what actually made me more confident about the alternative approach to intelligence, because intelligence agencies, they have long uh, been fixated on just wiretapping a few people's phone or you know, putting listening devices in certain people's offices so that they would know what's, what will happen tomorrow. But nowadays, there are only so many secrets you can still steal and keep, but so much knowledge can be generated elsewhere. And if, if we do that more often and take that more seriously, we may be able to see the trends uh, going forward uh, better than we could. So you mentioned that you have hope for the younger generations in terms of finding the truth or going against what is said by major news outlets and challenging things that have been put out. Does that hope extend to generations in China? Or what do you think is going to happen? I think it does uh, to, however, I have to say, a much lesser degree. Because like people in younger generations in China, they, they do have some ways to get around the Great Firewall. Uh, there's something called the VPN, Virtual Private Networks, uh, which you could allow you to bypass the censorship in China to see the outside world on the internet. Uh, but it's also very costly to maneuver because the Chinese government cracks down on these kind of uh, workarounds constantly, consistently. So you have to change your settings, you know, get a different software, uh, so every, every few days you have to change how you try to get on the internet uh, to the outside world. And that cause is uh, taking a toll on a lot of people. I've known a lot of my friends in China who was able to, or who were able to, or who were used to doing this. And then at some point they just told me, you know, unless it's something that's really important or really interesting to me, I just give up because it's, you know, I just don't bother because it's, you know, so costly. And so the cause, I think, uh, has deterred quite a bit of that curiosity. And it's, um, I mean, a lot of times you, you don't really have a lot of things that people uh, just couldn't sleep at night, <laughs> keeping them up, uh, trying to find the answers. Right? A lot of things, they, maybe they just don't care enough. Like if you uh, think of whether a average Chinese person would be curious enough to pay such a high cost in getting around the internet to learn about Tiananmen Square Massacre, would they? They probably would not because they didn't, they didn't even know there was such a thing as uh, Tiananmen Massacre, right? Because I did not know. Or 
do they would they try to find out the truth about forced labor in the Uyghur region? They probably would not because they would already be seeing the information put out by the government that that's a bogus claim. You know, the Uyghurs are living their happy life in the uh, what they call the career enhancement camp or education camp, uh, without saying that that's actually an internment camp. And so, so the, the motivation I think is not necessarily high enough for them to try to get around the information control. Wow. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm fearing, not fearing. I don't know. I, it's hard to have hope, I think, for me. And I'm kind of worried about all of this. I don't, is there anything that we can do? I think remembering, it goes back to what we started at the beginning. I think remembering history would go a long way. Um, it would take a lot of time, but uh, any less vigilance on our end would do damage to the uh, having a brighter future. Um, I don't know, this may sound a little cryptic, but let me give an example. The, uh, it also came to, occurred to me much later, I only recently learned, for example, in the U.S., that there was this internment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War. I know you probably have learned about it in your history class, but I, I did not learn about it until I came to America because uh, it was not taught in China. Maybe that was not relevant uh, in the Chinese perspective. And then after coming to, having come to America, I didn't see it on uh, the news that I regularly read either. It's just a subject that didn't come up very often, I guess. But I recently learned about it. And what was striking to me was actually how similar, if you think about the, how the government approaches the tragic event, how similar it is to the, the, the internment of uh, Uyghurs now in China. Because it was under the name of some certain national security excuse, right? The, the Pearl Harbor, certainly for the U.S., but then for China, it was they also framed the, the Uyghur region as separatist or terrorist uh, trying to threaten the ne Chinese national security. And if you look at how Chinese propaganda works, they would say, uh, those are not concentration camps. We are just finding better uh, employment uh, prospects for, for these uh, Uyghur minorities because they're lazy, they, do, they don't work hard enough or they don't learn, so we are training them so then they can find better jobs. There were similar propaganda efforts in the U.S., right? So we're saying that all these Japanese Americans, they were just relocating to these inland states, uh, you know, uh, living a happy life and finding better employment compared to where, where they used to live on the West Coast. It's very similar. But, but here's what gives me hope. Because despite the fact that so many major newspapers back in the days in the 40s, in the U.S. saying all these horrible things in support of the internment of those Japanese Americans. Many of them came out to apologize. Many of them, late, years later, decades later, uh, published articles about the truth or correcting their past uh, about uh, being biased or being discriminative uh, about toward those Japanese Americans. The United States government officially apologized for that. We are certainly not seeing that in China. So I think all these gave me hope in the sense that we, are, we live in a nevertheless free society, although it's inevitable that sometimes we succumb to propaganda, misinformation, or disinformation. But we still have the power to find out the truth or to propagate the truth. And that's the power that many of Chinese people do not have. And whether that could influence China, I think I, I'm a little skeptical, but I, I'm not losing hope yet. I think... Uh, even if you look at the China today, despite all the surveillance and uh, government control, the China today, I think objectively speaking, is still freer than the China in, say, the 70s under Mao. Right? So I think we, we should not lose hope or lose sight of the, the longer term progress or the longer term change. Uh, perhaps there's a chance to fight for a better future. And if we stop, we will lose that chance for sure. So at least that's a reason to not uh, give up. Thank you. I wish we had more time, but we only have time for one more question. 
What is one thing you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? That's a very interesting question. Uh, let me tell the story of, uh, so when I graduated from college in China, I was given this university medal. Uh, and then uh, the person who handed me the medal on the ceremony was the chief negotiator for China's accession to the WTO. I was quite unhappy about that. I was happy about the award, but I didn't like him. I didn't like him being the, uh, the person handing me the, the award because he was not popular in China. Uh, back in the days, the narrative was that he's sort of like betraying the national interest of China, negotiating for its accession to the WTO because we gave up too much to the Americans. Uh, nevertheless, <laughs> uh, he was not popular, but nevertheless, the China joined the WTO because we wanted to have a better future. We wanted to be a more open society and to be integrated into the liberal world order in some way. And that was actually the main uh, reason China joined, and many people in China believe that. So they didn't like him, but they are hopeful for a better future after China joined the WTO. I was one of them too. I thought engagement with the, the Western world would make China uh, a much, open, much opener society. Uh, I have since changed uh, the view in the sense that it did not seem to have uh, propel that progress as much as, much as uh, uh, we thought. For example, there was not even as many forced labor uh, uh, camps in China when China joined the WTO than it is now, right? Because it all happened uh, since President Xi Jinping took office or a couple of years after he took office. So there's a lot of darker side coming out from developments in China that people who were hopeful for uh, engagement back then, 20 years ago, uh, did not see coming. And uh, I have to admit, I was one of them too. But it, it doesn't matter, I guess. Not, doesn't, no, it does, not that it doesn't matter, but it's okay. Um, I, at this juncture, I think it's a good opportunity to remember the quote attributed to Keynes, who said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? That's what he said. So I think we should be open-minded. Uh, sometimes we could be wrong, but uh, it's okay as long as we don't give up uh, learning or pursuing the truth. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest for their time and insight. And I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you.